Welcome to Let's Grab a Cup podcast, this is where we talk about leadership, authenticity, resiliency, and we provide a place to hold space for one another. I'm your host, Adam Sturgeon, so why don't you grab a cup of coffee, get tea, or whatever suits you at this moment. Let's dive in. All right, good morning. My name is Adam Sturgeon, and this is the Let's Grab a Cup podcast. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to Jim Hyde. Jim was a... Uh, was a police officer for over 31 years in um, over four four California agencies, is what you said, Jim? Yeah. And Jim retired as a police chief, and he was actually a chief in two different agencies, one in the city of Davis and then retired from the city of Antioch um, after a few years there. And uh, right now, Jim is in charge of the uh, Peer Support Central, where he does a lot of peer support and also support on – First responders transitioning into retirement, and this is a company that Jim has been doing for uh, about 15 years. So we like to get into that today, and I really uh, appreciate you coming on this morning and uh, you know, just helping us all through this transition time in our lives. Yeah. Crazy times, crazy times in America, first responders and their families. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the family is always is one of the things that we always kind of forget and put in the back burner, but that's definitely like the support of, of all of us, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can't do it alone. That's right. So I get, I like to start these off with really just hearing your story and like kind of how you got into law enforcement and um, maybe your, your your growth and what you grew up, how you grew up and where you where you decided to do this from. Yeah. So let's see. Getting into the job was um, uh, got a football scholarship back east. I grew up in San Francisco, and then um, trying to I start off as pre med because I have a lot of family members, rather than nurses or doctors. And kind of looked at that. And then um, I looked at the how long it takes to get there. And I was just like, I don't know. So um, I started looking around at other things and took a couple, you know, courses, just kind of sampling it and fell in love with uh, criminal justice. It just intrigued me. It was um, ever changing and a challenge. And then I started looking at what careers, um, you know, you can go in, into uh, the criminal justice system. And, and I just really, I, growing up in San Francisco, a uh, blue collar city, a neighborhood is, you know, we had a couple of San Francisco PD um, officers who lived in the neighborhood and I, you know, hung out with their kids and all that. So it was kind of like this subtle kind of um, interest in it. And then um, started applying after I graduate, because of course you got to get a job, right? Right. And um, started applying and, and got hired by um, uh, North Bay Area City, Nevada. Loved working there. Was there for um, eight years but couldn't buy a house in Marin County. Marin County was the highest priced um, housing market in the country at the time. <clears throat> so of course, cop salary, that wasn't gonna work. Uh, went up to Sacramento one weekend, visit friends. We drove around looking at houses and went back the next week and bought a house on a leap yeah, of faith. Sacramento. <laughs> right? And then uh, like so many of us, right? We're trying to find a home and that we could afford and kind of put our roots down. And then uh, started applying to agencies in Sacramento and got hired six months later by Sacramento Police Department. Was there for uh, almost 16 years and left there to be a chief in the city of Davis, which is about uh, 30 miles uh, west of Sacramento off the uh, Interstate 80 corridor. Was there for three and a half years, uh, three years. <coughs> and then uh, got recruited to the city of Antioch, East Bay Area, Contra Costa County. Um, Good community, but fast growth, kind of the story of much of America's, um, you know, metropolitan regions where they keep growing, but they their small communities get uh, overwhelmed pretty quickly with, um, you know, more housing, more population, so forth. So uh, so my, my specialty is to go in and come up with a plan for an organization and then help them implement and support them in that process. So that's how I got in law enforcement. And, and, and of course, it became a passion, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, like, so you were in college as pre-med or you just looked at pre-med? No, I actually started off as a freshman pre-med. That's interesting. Yeah. I, that's funny because I actually did biochemistry when I started and then I was like, no, nah, maybe I'm going to. Yeah, same thing, right? Yeah. That's, and like, yeah. Uh, it's interesting, but I don't know if I could do a whole life doing this. Yeah, right? the criminal justice definitely uh, was uh, kind of like sparked my interest as well. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you uh, you had some friends that were doing that were in law enforcement when you were young. Did you do on uh, ride alongs and stuff? No, not at all. But <clears throat> my friends would tell me stories of their parents, okay. and I was kind of intrigued. And then I I talked to one of my neighbors, who's San Francisco PD, and I said, "Hey, I'm kind of interested. Tell me about the job." And then you know right away start off with, um, you know, you need to know the bad stuff first. 
And I was kind of like, okay. And I was kind of like, uh, I'm okay with that. And so it just, I always had that interest, you know, of uh, possibility. And at that time in your life, you, you have a lot of interest and you, you start thinking about where can I go? Right. Uh, the one thing I did want to do is go away from home. Um, grew up in a very chaotic home. Parents were alcoholics. Had an older brother who was very disabled. Took care of him. Um, but there's a certain point in which you have to go live your own life. Um, so. And where was her? Where, where was home again? Uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. And then the Sacramento was like an hour away, right? Uh, about two hours. Two hours. Yeah, it's it's good enough distance where you can still visit, but you're not like oh yeah right next to your house. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going every weekend to visit folks. Yeah. I'm always curious how, like when you move up, so you moved up through um, Sacramento, like how far did you go up in Sacramento? Uh, so I, I went up to captain level. Um, I like, it, I've been able to work e almost every assignment in policing, except I wasn't a pilot because I flew in a lot of helicopters on task force stuff. I wasn't a canine officer because I had dogs at home and I wasn't a mounted horse officer because we had horses uh, that the kids were raised on. But I just love the experience and learning something new. Um, I'm one of those kind of like a lot of folks, lifetime learners. So I'm always like, okay, I've tried this. Let me try something else. And then how did you decide to go to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply for chief. Like what made you decide that step? Uh, you know, just opportunity. I also, I became Mr. Fix-It in the police department in Sacramento. And I, they kept moving me around to fix things. But I saw other people being rewarded for doing nothing. And there's that certain point where you kind of go, um, you get typecast sometimes as an actor is, oh, we'll use him to fix stuff. Um, and so finally, I just reached a decision. And the other thing, too, is once you leave one department, your mind is more open to other opportunities, um, whether it's in policing, uh, first responder work or, or corporate or education, something like that. It's like once you make that first move from your first home base, it's a little bit easier to look around and go, okay, I know what the process will be and what I need to do if I want to do it. Right. Yeah, I do. I see that a lot where people feel like they get stuck, like in their agencies, you get kind of like, I used to typecast it, but I feel like you're on a path and maybe it's just, you know, in Long Beach when I was working there, but like, it was like, you're, you're kind of in a, in a forward momentum in one direction Yeah. and it's hard to get out of it. It's hard to switch over. And, it, and then once you do, maybe you do, but you're now you're in that direction. It's, it's kind of hard to go back and forth. Some people are able to do everything, but some people will just like, you're stuck. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the other thing too, what I found is there's always favorites in every organization, whether that's Coca-Cola to policing, right? Is, um, you know, I had a lot of opportunities, but then there was that group of folks. And I think organizations go through these cycles where they get stagnant and, um, you know, they, they really don't want to grow that, you know, it's usually the CEO of the organization who's like, oh, that's just putting in maintenance mode. Uh, don't make any moves. I don't want to upset the apple cart. You know, basically I want to keep my job, but I don't want to have to do anything in my job. And it just reached a point where it was just time to go and grow. And that's a term I use quite a bit with folks when I'm doing some coaching with them about their careers is, you know, whatever their profession is, is sometimes this is an opportunity as much as it being scary it's it's an opportunity at least go try so when you're a chief how do you prevent like you're since you're two different agencies how do you prevent yourself from being stuck in those and then that in that same cycle where you're like okay now we're in the status quo everything's good we're not growing necessarily but we're not really like hurting and i know there's an idea of like if you're not growing you're not like you are hurt I, what's it what is it like you're not growing you're <coughs> you're not going forward or whatever but i'm wondering how you as a chief um keep yourself from doing that getting stuck in those cycles? Yeah, for me, I'm the guy who goes in to fix things. Um, so that's kind of way the label I got uh, from the executive, um, you know, search companies is, um, I'm not the guy that's gonna come in and just keep the lights on. I'm the guy that you wanna hire when you need to fix things. Um, and so, you know, that what that's my forte. So coming in the door, I knew I was gonna be busy. And, and you know, you just don't come in as a, as a CEO and give, you know, executive direction. I know everything. I mean, you're a fool if you try that. It's right. just to go in and start asking good questions of folks, you know, and I'd always ask, I'd interview folks um, in most, almost all the organizations is, you know, <laughs> what works here, what needs to be fixed, and what are the questions do you have about, you know, direction of the organization? 
And I got a lot of good information about that. And then you started to see these themes develop. And then I'm, uh, and my forte is, is uh, strategic planning. So then we developed those themes into goals. Um, and that would be very inclusive. We'd have a, a strategic planning committee and we do a lot of outreach, not just in the organization, but also in the community and, and, um, and you know, other, other folks, as we say, partners in, um, in public safety. So I was always busy. It and, then, I, and that was, that was I didn't like the maintenance mode. Yeah, and again, I can see that if you're like always trying to go forward, like once it gets to maintenance, it's kind of like time to move on almost. Yeah. What? So then, when you were you recruited for Davis as well? Yeah. Or did you put it. Did you kind of seek it out. Yeah. So um, you typically start off for those folks who are interested. Is you call one of these executive search firms and say, "Hey, I'm interested. Can I meet with one of the the search um, executives?" And then you sit <laughs> sit down. <coughs> excuse me, still getting over the pneumonia stuff, is you sit down, they look at your skill set, they look at your resume, um, and then they, okay, well, we'll keep you in mind if something comes up. And that all that really happens is when there's other tests that come up for, for that position, chief or whatever it is, say a captain or even a sergeant, depending upon the size of the organization, is then <laughs> they call you and say, hey, are you interested? Um, because that's a big step too, because when they when your organization hears you're thinking about leaving um two things either happen is they try to pull you back with some type of promise of an assignment <coughs> or is uh well then get out of here if you're not a loyal team player get out which i always thought was foolish you'd never do that in pro sports right you want to hang on to your talent right um uh, you know so there's and you know this in first responder communities a lot of egos um, and so we, we work around those egos through our career, but there's a certain point which is go, you know, I, I don't need to, to, you know, keep fighting some of these egos that just move forward. You know, it's better for me. It's better for them. Just go on. Life's too short. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I, I'm always surprised about that. Like idea of like, if you're, if you have valuable people in your organization and they are leaving, especially right now, I feel like that's happening quite a bit. Um, yeah what are organizations doing? Are they just like, okay, it is what it is. Like they're just going to let people go and not be, it is what, we're not going to do anything to stop them. Or um, do they understand why they're leaving or, and they, and they accept it, or are they going to try to keep them and do things to keep them? Cause I don't, I don't, I guess I haven't seen that right now. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of like, um, a lot of enticing to keep people. Yeah. And you know, how <laughs> right, now, right now to recruit anywhere. Yeah, <clears throat> you're starting to see that kind of free agency pop up now where come here and we'll give you a hiring bonus type of thing. But that's for laterals. For new folks coming in the job, there really isn't much marketing other than the classic stuff is go to a job fair, stand there in uniform and hand out brochures and, and you know, hope you get a couple of folks there. I've always been disappointed in how we market our successes as, as uh, you know, law enforcement organizations, first responder organizations. We can do a whole lot better. Uh, there was a point at, at Sacramento in which we struggled with recruitment, uh, looking for talent, of course, talent diversity, um, you know, and folks who are more that kind of um, had more college education. doesn't mean they graduated, but they were on that track, right? Is uh, to then, we hired a marketing firm, which I thought was a great idea. And, you know, most of the cost was covered by a, a grant, but they came up with this term of a, the call to service which just really resonated with folks. And they're like, you know, it's, and I think that's the, the same model the United States military uses, right? Hey, well, you're not gonna be a millionaire being a soldier or a grunt, but you know, it's a call to service and you're gonna, you know, what you're gonna do has purpose and meaning to, you know, to help other people. So I, I always think we could do a better job of that in, in our profession. Yeah, I think it's uh, the problem isn't, Oh, I think there's a problem with that as far as recruitment goes. And I also think that once you get in, you don't have a lot of people who are doing the job right now who are excited about it and few who feel the backing of their agency. So therefore you lose that like internal, like, you know, when I was, when I started, I was like, yeah, you should come, you should come, you should come. And then at a certain point, it's like, um, there's other things to do. Like you do, you, yeah. you maybe, you, maybe you could pick something else. Like I, I, I don't know, you get to that point where it's kind of like, what, what else is there out there? But I know that's not everybody and we need to look for the people who are still like able to you know see the value of what we want to do here and make yeah. change 
I, I think you and I struggle with the California environment, right? But when you go across the country, you know, the majority of the country, you know, they still love the profession. Um, they struggle because of changing times and politics and so forth, but the vast majority still love the profession. But, you know, here's something that I've seen when, you know, we're doing our peer support classes. I always survey the classes with questions and exercises. <clears throat> and one of the questions was, will you encourage your children to go into the job, into policing? And the vast majority of them say no. And when I asked in the past, would you have them? And a lot of them said, oh, yeah, yeah, kind of like the family business. Right. So that's a big change because think about it. I used to be a background recruiting sergeant. <coughs> One third of the folks that came to apply uh, were either law enforcement family members or friends of law enforcement and family members. Kind of like the electrician or plumbers um, right. unions is, hey, my dad or mom did this uh, or my neighbor does this. I'm kind of interested. Tell me more. What we're doing now is we're telling our kids don't go into the job. It's not what it was. And that's a that's that's the sad part. Yeah. Right. Is um, and we're trying to protect our kids. And in that process, you know, it's also um, we're not getting the talent and uh, that we would from another sector of the, the recruitment population. Right. And you taught you brought up this, your peer support. And I was going to ask you, how, how how long have you been doing peer supporting and what got you into it? Oh, boy. About 28 years. Started off being helped by a peer supporter after um, uh, a shooting. <coughs> Had another shooting six weeks later. Really? And, and just really struggled. Um, and then, you know, a lot of near shootings, kid deaths, that type of stuff really started to spin. And um, so just having that peer embedded behavioral health program, that's really what peer support is. It's just having, you know, one or two peers come alongside and say, how you doing? And uh, here's the resource, a counseling resource. Um, you know, just someone to talk to that knew the job and you didn't have to explain it. Um, you could have a real conversation, but there, but it was directed towards, you know, getting better. So that's, I got interested in that. Then I got recruited into the program at Sacramento PD as a peer and then just started learning and then ultimately co-coordinated the program, um, with someone who became my wife later on, uh, Susan and, um, she worked at SAC PD as an officer and then a sergeant. <coughs> so we just uh, learned a ton of experience. We started teaching the, the peer support class internally um, ourselves because of budget issues. Of course, we couldn't bring in trainers. Um, and then we just started getting requests from other agencies to, to provide the training. And that kind of led to where we are today. And so you, when did you start your company? Oh, boy. 15 years ago, 15, 16 years ago now, formally started a company. Before that, we would do the training for free for agencies. Okay. You know, just, you know, work it out with my organization, uh, our organization on, you know, release time so we can go teach. So we're not out. We're, I don't want to burn vac my vacation time to right. go teach peer support to somebody else. You know, it's like, okay, you're getting it for free. You're getting the, the experience of wisdom on program building. And I'm supposed to give up my vacation time. Uh, which I ended ultimately doing for the military uh, when I first started doing peer support training for deploying soldiers when we first started off with uh, after 9-11. Um, I was taking vacation time uh, from SAC PD. And then when I uh, went to Davis, here's a little side note, I go to Davis and um, I'm having <laughs> lunch with the mayor. And I said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm doing this training for the military. And, you know, classic college committee, oh, Jim, you can't tell anybody. I go, what? Oh, you can't tell anybody. You know, even though we we support soldiers or we say we support soldiers, we really don't. You know, so you can't tell anybody. I just thought, and I was just like, I said, well, I'm doing this on my vacation time. I've been doing it. Oh, I don't think you can do it on your vacation time. I said, it's my vacation time. But it just shows you the mental context of where they were coming from is you know, the, the big lie. Oh, we're, yeah. We say this, but we do this. And just, you were the, you were the chief at this point? Yeah. 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 I remember just shaking my head. That and makes smiling no sense. You know, uh, it just, you know, change the topic. Uh, I'm talking to someone who will never get it and <laughs> is a politician. Right. So when you have somebody like that as your mayor and you're the chief of police and you have an organization of people who are looking up to you for guidance. Now your mayor says, Hey, this is where, this is our direction. Right. 
how do you as chief with not agreeing necessarily with the mayor's intent or their mindset on, on something still related to your people in a way where you're like, okay, this is what we're going to do. <coughs> even if you don't believe in it. Uh, you know, so, <coughs> excuse me. The one thing about being a, um, a police chief is you do have a lot of authority and autonomy. And so I would just, I would talk to the, the elected city council and say, okay, well, the law doesn't allow us to do that. Um, and um, the other piece of that is I do, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't have magical policing where we don't see police officers out there doing patrol, working with the community, and then expect crime's going to go down, right? It just doesn't happen. It's ridiculous. But that's the mindset that they, <laughs> you know, na naive context are coming from. Um, here, here's a good example is that same mayor, <clears throat> a couple months later, calls me up and said, hey, Jim, um, you know, we have farmer's market on Saturday mornings, and there's a lot of traffic downtown. Can we get an officer out there to direct traffic? I said, okay, let me talk to city manager. So city managers really the, they run this, the operations of the right. city. And then I'm a department head, right, uh, among others, like public, public work, recreation, so forth. And uh, I said, well, let me talk to city manager. And she goes, I already talked to him, and he's approved it. I go, okay, well, so I hang up, I call him, and he doesn't know about this. She lied again. And uh, so <clears throat> we're in a department head meeting a couple of days later, and she comes into the meeting, just kind of burst in. It was the nature of her personality. She thought she had more authority than she did. Um, and she says, you know, I, I, do I got my, my police officer for Saturday for Farmer's Market? And I said, well, we're, that's one of the topics we're going to discuss here because that's not funded. Oh, well, you know, you can just pull somebody from other assignment. And I said, well... You know, we don't have a lot of resources, and um, so we're going to talk about that, and it's a special event. And by the way, the the uh, city and the Farmers Market Association make money, so is there a way to use some of those funds for that? Oh, you should do it for free. And I said, well, City Magic kind of stood, stepped in and said that. She goes, and by the way, um, you know, because people really don't like police officers here, can we have the officer dress up as a carrot? What? Direct traffic, Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is me. did you really say that? I look at the city manager and he's just like, look at me like, you know, you know, don't, you know, don't create a conflict. And I said, well, we can look at that. Let me do some research because I don't think the law allows you to direct traffic um, out of uniform. Um, even Caltrans, you know, California Transportation, the, yeah. the folks who repair the, uh, the roadways in California, they have to wear a uniform so they don't get run over. Oh, well, you know, the carrot can wear a vest. And I was just like, this is nuts. So I said, okay, well, let me research it. And, you know, it, don't get into a conflict, but, you know, don't be a fool. So ultimately, you know, I told her uh, we can't do that because it violated the law. And I cited the uh, vehicle code section. It was, but that just tells you the mindset of folks who are trying to, you know, tell us how to do our job. So let's say in that scenario, I think that's crazy, but let's say in that scenario, it wasn't against the law to dress up i wouldn't do it i mean i would if, okay. if i would i would not stand out there i was a motor cop for four years right riding a bike <clears throat> there's no way i would stand out in the intersection dressed up as a carrot right i would be a smash carrot in no time right so i'm not gonna put one of my folks out there to do that I'm, it puts them in harm's way that's stupid yeah. to, so some you know and then you know the nature of this as time went on you just saw the line continue and you're like, and she'll never admit that that's what she wanted if the officer got run over, right? The sad thing is there are chiefs out there who would actually do that. I know. I think, I feel like I'd be in there and say like, without even looking it up, I would like, no. Like, I mean, I get that, like the idea of like, you want to have some backbone to tell why you're saying no. It's like, but you're to, I can't believe that you're right. There's probably chiefs out here who would, <coughs> okay, we'll find, a way, we'll find a way to do it. Yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. So you're so you got into peer support pretty early on, um, and you continued to do it throughout your career. When did you transition to this idea of? I know I want to get into it, but like your focus on helping people, helping other people transition into retirement. Um, you know, what we saw was because um, my wife at that point I had left to be a chief in other cities. She was the full time peer coordinator. Um, because they'd had two back-to-back uh, -back suicides at a month and a half to two months apart. 
back in 2008. So the chief approached her and said, what do we do? And she said, well, these are things you need to do. And one of them is you need to make a full-time coordinator. And he said, okay, that's you. And she goes, but I, she was a road dog. She loved working the street. And she goes, and he says, well, uh, it'll be a 90 day assignment. Okay. By the MOU, they could do that. And uh, so she did it. And then one thing led to another where she kept building out the program and then it's hard to leave. Right. <clears throat> yeah, of course. <laughs> So what she saw was, remember, 07 is when we started the layoffs across the country or the job hiring freezes, right, for first responders, is she saw the veteran police officers leaving, you know, some cities offered a golden handshake. Most didn't. They didn't have the money. Um, so they were leaving, and she would interview them before they left, you know, do, just doing her peer sport thing. Are you ready for retirement? All those other things. And she'd done some research. But she started tracking them over time, um, pre-retirement, retirement, and then afterwards, and started continuing the, the questions. What we started, started to see was um, an increase in um, divorces, suicide, depression, and substance abuse were the biggies. Um, and so the question is, why? Um, and out of that was, <laughs> with the divorces, it was... Um, can I live with this, my spouse, Nick, Sniffkin, and other full time, which is biggie, right? right? Um, and that's for um, fire, law, and paramedics, okay? The other one was uh, substance abuse, which was alcohol predominantly. That's the drug of our choice in policing besides coffee is um, so you knew that you could have a, a couple drinks, um, but you had to be at work, right? Or there was some type of, well, when you retire, there's no schedule to meet. You don't have to be at work. So it also means you don't have to be sober at 10 o'clock in the morning. So we started this creep, right? The cocktail hour went from 6 p.m. to 5 to 3 to noon. And then, you know, well, why wait around the noon? It's 11 or 1130. So yeah. we saw this creep, not everybody, but a significant number of people that was concerning. <clears throat> we also saw suicides go up. And that was the uh, increase in depression, um, years of, of limited sleep had changed their brain chemistry. So typically when you survey first responders, so I've been doing this for quite a while, across the country and you ask them, um, how many hours of sleep do you typically get a day, a 24 hour period? It's between four and six hours of sleep for law enforcement. <clears throat> Ours is a little bit different. It's based upon uh, if they're working in a metropolitan setting or a rural setting. Right. Metropolitan setting, it's almost the same, four to six hours. Which and what also happens is on their days off is um, they can't catch up on sleep because they're catching up on life, right? Family life, kid life, um, kind of recovering from the shift work and the demands of, of um, you know day to day you know operational experience um, performance. So um, we saw all these tell telltale things. Also, we saw um, uh, longevity was much lower than the average population. So why was that? Years of sleep deprivation, poor diets. Um, and then the other thing too is um, first responders, what we call as occupational <coughs> athletes, occupational athletes. They have to have a set of athletic skills to perform the job. Is like a professional sports athlete is you wanna stay on the field to play as long as you can, which means you defer your medical issues until after you retire. And then when you retire, you're like, okay, well, now I need to fix the shoulder, the knee. Uh, you know, my blood pressure is a little high. I probably need to work on that. So what we saw is many of them waited too long. And the health issues just crept on them and took their life. So all these pieces came together in the study where you're just like, and that's kind of led to us, you know, we're, we're good at teaching people how to get in the job. We're good at keeping them in the job, you know, as far as training, skill training, so forth. Right. We're terrible on helping them get out of the job and go on to their next life. And that can, especially the, the workers' comp cases, you know, the medically retired folks, oh my God, their numbers are terrible. Um, and they all want to be back on the field of play. They may leave and go, you know, I'm going to go in a new direction stuff. <laughs> but their heart of hearts, they still want to be on that field of play. I can't tell you how many of these folks I've interviewed and they go, you know, when I left, I thought things would be better and all that. And I really miss being there. Yeah. As much as I hated it, I miss it and I love it.
That's so strange. I mean, I completely understand the idea of like, yeah, you, 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 that hate, love, hate thing. Like you, it's like, oh, I'm at work. I don't want to be here. And then like you're off for two weeks. You're like, oh, I'm, you oh, need yeah. to get back or you need to get, you feel like you want to get back to work, even though it's the same place you just wanted to take a break from. Yeah. Like a caged lion, huh? Just pacing. Yeah, yeah exactly. In your head. Right? <laughs> That's nuts. But that makes sense though. I get like, and then they talk about the idea of once you separate from, policing in general it's like you're not part of the club anymore yeah i've heard that i've heard that so many times people say like you don't have access to the building people have to let you in you're you know obviously you don't have your bat i mean you do have a badge but you know it's not the same um and i've i mean even as a young officer i remember stop like talking to people on the whenever randomly and they say oh i retired oh i retired from long beach or i retired from here and it's like oh 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 cool it's not like it's not necessarily especially as a young officer you're not necessarily like oh my gosh like overwhelmingly interested in yeah in tell me stories are. about yeah. what it looked like right it's like uh, oh, it's nice i'm yeah. moving on yeah i got a call i got a call to deal with you know it's like you're yeah. just like moving on um obviously i'm finding that a little different now it's like all this is about like hearing people's you know stories about how they did their job but it's yeah it's definitely interesting when you're young and you probably feel that when you're older like you're not you're not connected to it anymore you don't have the, you're not getting the respect that you felt like you should be getting from the younger guys. <clears throat> you know, it reminds me in the workshops, the retirement workshops for first responders, we actually help you come up with your elevator speech. So here's something interesting because I get to travel across the globe is in Europe, they'll ask you, tell me about you, Jim. In America, we start off with, so what do you do? What's your job? See the difference? Yeah. Subtle difference. Where in America, you're based upon what job you have. And that puts you in this rank order of, you know, influence, power, interest, right. that type of stuff, right? Like a celebrity. Yeah. You're either, yeah. <clears throat> you're either Tom Hanks up here or you're somebody else, right? Um, the paper boy, right? The adult paper boy, whatever. Um, just kind of somewhere on that hierarchy is we help them come up with that elevator speech. So someone says, hey, so what do you do? This is American born. So what do you do is we, and we tell them, and do not put in the word retired. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because as soon as you say retired in America, people go, they discount you in a subtle way. You know, they say, oh, that's nice. Um, maybe someday for me in their head, they'll say that, but you get discounted right away. So, so what would you, so what would the elevator speech be? <clears throat> well, for me is um, when they ask, what do I do is I work on complex human problems across the globe. And right. then they're like, well, what does that mean? I never mentioned retired. I said, well, so I'm talking present day and moving forward. So, you know, I help first responders, military professionals with PTSD prevention and, you know, building peer support teams, which are trauma support teams, so they can get through the difficult challenges of their career. And everyone's like, oh, that's needed, you know? So then right. they have an interest in you. Yes. Uh, but if you talk about your past, unless you're a sports athlete, you know, where they're like, hey, so tell me about, you know, that home run you hit in the World Series. No one cares about us. Yeah. Right? So stop working from that. I mean, yes, is it nice to be retired for, for some folks? Yes, it is. But here's the, the deal for us as first responders. <clears throat> and what I call as high performers is um, it's hard to go from 120 miles an hour to the speed limit of 55. Right? Right. So... How do we get there? And it's okay if you're ready to retire. Like, hey, I'm I'm retired. I'm I love my grandkids, or I travel, whatever it is. Um, and that's fine to say you're retired, but don't. But when you say it, expect people to not really care. Yeah, that's so interesting. So then, in your, you say in Europe, they say they ask you, tell me about you. Yeah, tell me about you. So your family, where you live, right. what's it like living there, right? Right. Nothing, and the job is farther down in the list of questions. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting, and I know that especially, especially with law enforcement, we all, I think, specifically like first responders and law enforcement, we all, or maybe most of us, most of us can't say we all, but most of us do that thing where we identify specifically with with our job. Like I am a police officer, or I am a police chief, or whatever. It's like I am this thing, and it's like hard to separate yourself from from that being. I am a firefighter. Versus like, I am a father or I am a, you know, it's like, yeah, completely, it's completely different in how we identify ourselves. Yeah. 
that could be <laughs> challenge. So then what, so what steps do people start finding you in this process of, are they finding you before they retire? Are they finding you at a certain time before they retire? Are they finding you after they retire? When are they finding um, you to- All, to the, all the above. Um, there, we kind of do this thing with retirement is when you ask them, you know, a lot of people don't tell you they're going to retire. You know, it's a, a lot of first responders just don't show up on Monday. And it was like, where's Jim? Oh, you didn't hear he retired. I want, I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. And you know why we do that? We're afraid of crying in the workplace. It is so emotional. It's a grieving process. Um, you know, the last year in the job, you start thinking about, and you know in your head, I'm leaving on this date, is you start thinking about, did I make a difference in the world in the job? What will I miss? What do I like? Will people still talk to me? Um, because now I've moved from the field of play to, I think your first year out, you can be on the sidelines, but you can't be on the field of play. And year two, you're up in the stands. You're not allowed on the on the sidelines at all. <clears throat> so it's just interesting how, you know, we form this uh, cognitive set around um, around our careers. Yeah, I find myself, I found myself doing that last year. I leave, yeah. leave, leave in California, leave moment. I, I find myself doing that a lot. Like um, just the idea of, like what, what kind of, what, not say legacy, but what am I leaving behind here? And it is, and I've, I felt this for a while though, this idea of like when people are out for, for several months, people get injured on duty or they just, they're just kind of like out of, out of sight, out of mind. We, we all do this. We kind of forget about people. Mm -hmm. you, know, you forget about, And I knew, I saw that so many times where someone would come back and be like, or, and I would say, Hey, oh my, oh, how, where have you been? And like, oh uh, yeah, I was gone for like six months. Yeah. I'm like, and what happened? Oh, I, you didn't hear my, oh, I broke my knee or whatever it was. Right. And then you're like, and you kind of feel bad. Like, well, I didn't even know a and B I didn't definitely didn't do my part of checking in on them, you know? So it's like, what, what kind of idea was I going to leave, you know, my last position. So I just decided, I decided for myself, I said, I, I'm going to just, my goal is just to take care of the people around me, whatever that looks like to make sure that they feel, they feel valued and, it, I understand when I'm gone, I'm gone. Like it's, there's someone else is going to be in my position. It is what it is. It's not like, I'm not saying I'm making a, a huge impact on it, on saving the world or anything, but just taking care of the people that were right around me that I could have, you know, influence on. That was it. That's all I was worried about. And then beyond that, it's not my, honestly, it's like, it's not my problem. <laughs> it's, a, it's like, I'm like, I'm not taking, I'm not taking responsibility for everything else. Just the people I have yeah. direct influence on around. So. And that's hard to do because we're trained from the Academy forward is, look after the community. So we're trying to help everybody and we're forgetting the people who are most valued to us is our family, right? right? So when you retire, who's gonna be holding your hand in the ER room? Cause you, you have chest uh, palpitations or chest pain. It's gonna be your family. It's not gonna be someone from work, no. right? So yeah. take care of treasure those folks that um, your family, you know, don't even know you're you there, have to restart, too. right? Yeah. a divorce, I get that part but restart and build. Yeah. Yeah. And they won't, your work coworkers won't even know you're in the hospital until like six months later. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what, what happened to you? Yeah. <clears throat> so do you have some like steps? Like what are some basic steps if people right now are in that process of like just thinking about retiring or maybe they just, they just pulled the plug and they're, they're leaving. Uh, what, what are some basic steps that they can take <coughs> um, before they find you or even on the way to finding your, your programs? Um, number one is what I like to, I'll tell them, I said, take two to four weeks off, however way you do that, you know, vacation time, CTO, however way, just to see if you're ready to retire. Some folks are like, you know, after a week, they're like, yes, I am. Or other ones are like, I'm not sure. I want you to make the decision before you make the decision. You know what I mean by that is I set my date. I'm leaving on this date and by God, I'm going to leave on this date but I really don't know what I'm going to. The classic story, and you, you heard this a thousand times from your, your, uh, your, your friends, your colleagues. Um, well, I'm going to go fishing. Really? 24-7? Really? Yeah. How are you going to do that? <clears throat> that type of nonsense, right? So we have this big lie we tell others, but inside we're kind of like, uh, I'll figure it out. I figured everything out. So what I wanted to just take some time and think about, are they really ready to retire? And if they are, then start looking at, we're purpose-driven people. Um, so what's going to be my new purpose? Because you just don't turn it off. You know, it's that thing that feeds you every day. 
Um, so purpose driven. So and that could be meals on wheels for free. It could be volunteering, if, you know, nonprofit work, whatever. Or it can be another job. Uh, here's the other thing too: never disvalue the set of skills the job gave you that you can use in other arenas, whatever that is. Right? We we can have complex communications and crisis situations with human beings under the influence of various substances. And somehow we we stop violence. <coughs> or we can do interviews of folks who are going into the business, doing background. So it can be related to our profession. It could be teaching at the community college on, you know, police science. Um, you know, all these different things. Or choose something totally different. I know friends um, who uh, left the job, retired, and they're teaching um, teaching chemistry at a high school. And you ask them chemistry. Yeah, you know, I really loved chemistry when I was a kid. And it was one of those things. And then, you know, I, I got you know, got into the, the career and then, but I, I went back and I thought, you know, I wouldn't mind going back into <laughs> junior high, uh, <laughs> high school setting and teach. And they love it. It's like they have this newborn energy. And you're like, cool, great, wonderful, good for you. Um, the, the one person I worry about is that person who shows up at one of our workshop shops who's been out for two to five years and they're stuck. And you can see it on their body and their face when they come in. And we'll do this introduction, you know, you know, why are you here? How long have you been retired? Uh, which, or, you know, when are you gonna retire? Um, you know, what are your plans, that type of thing? <laughs> and those guys and gals who are stuck is they'll just sit there and they're just like, I. Uh, and either use the term I'm stuck or I, I need to find something because I can't go this, I can't live this way anymore. There'll be times where the spouse, significant other, will bring the first responder in who's been retired or getting retired and said, he's here because I told him if he doesn't come to this workshop, I'm going to divorce him. Because if I don't divorce him, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> like, whoa, okay. <laughs> so it just tells you the level of emotion. Right. You know, it goes into so think about this it's hard to get on the first responder train right all the the interviews you do backgrounds like you finally get hired you you get in the academy training probation all that stuff <laughs> excuse me it's hard to get on the train it's hard to stay on the train as the career because it's not easy right right think of all the different near misses times in which your your spouse comes to you and say um you know we don't like you anymore because uh, the job changed you, whatever those issues are, it's also hard to get off the train. And we would think intuitively, thank God we got off, we're out, right? And then we get off and we're like, we're lost. We're on the side of that that empty uh, train track, watching the train continue down the roadway because the mission is always going on. The first responder mission is always in movement, but it's moving away from you at this point now. Right. So I had... I got from you take, take time away two yeah. to four weeks to just gather yourself and figure out if that's even something you can do um, without being tied to work at all, whether you're yeah. vacation or time off. Um, number two, find a purpose other than the job, whether it's like, you know, volunteering, find an organization, do something different and then never disvalue your skills. Yeah. I think that's one thing that we, we kind of do like, well, what can you do? What can you bring to the, to this new job? If you want a new job and it's like, I don't, what can I do? Like, all I know is how to do is be a police officer, but you don't really like really saying that I, all I can do is this is really how, how many skills have you, like you said, gained in these, in these years of being a police officer. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, so where can they find your website and where, where they can, where can they find you <coughs> right now at, at um, a class coming up? So um, right now uh, for the retirement stuff would be um, first responder retirement.com firstresponderretirement.com and then for the peer support work is peersupportcentral.com peersupportcentral.com and for peer support central is that you training other su peer supporters or is that you providing peer support for people uh, training other folks and then so we we not just train uh, we also help them build their program if they're starting from scratch or help them rejuvenate their program um, and then just be that consultant. So I've got several calls this week from firefighter, you know, peer coordinators, the different agencies 
across the country, law, fire, paramedic services, saying, hey, Jim, we're dealing with this one unique case. Um, well, the example two days ago was uh, we had this firefighter who admitted to a peer that he's been having suicidal thoughts. And can I just run through what we are doing? Um, and they were doing everything great. And I said, so the only thing I would add is think about next week is adding this into the plan, the care plan. And, it, you know, I, in fact, I just emailed her today and just said, you know, she'd sent, hey, thank you for, you know, taking time out with me the other day to help our firefighter. And I, so I said, thank you. Um, you know, I just really appreciate the call. You know, we always promise um, lifetime consulting, right, is can call. A lot of times it's just, am I doing the right thing? Did I miss something? Really, do I get the call of, I don't know what to do. Um, now we will get, now with the military, so I spent um, 15 years training uh, soldiers deploying to the Middle East and psychological survival and, and building peer support teams and running an embedded behavioral health program when they came back for California Army Air National Guard is um, I still get those calls about, hey, I have this friend, he's in the military and um, he's not answering his phone and I'm thinking the worst. And that's more of starting from scratch, uh, doing the peer support thing. So I just tell them, you know, I was an Army behavioral health officer, blah, blah, blah. And this is what I used to do. And so you know, I'm a resource to you. And, and how you doing? Because a lot of people are worried about you. And um, that's what we're talking now. So they have that kind of, like in, in public safety, especially your particular um, subset of public safety, say law enforcement. Cops can talk to cops pretty easily wherever you go in the in the world. Right. I was in Stockholm right before they closed everything down with COVID, and sitting at a table with some, uh, you know, they, they have a national police force. They don't, don't don't have local forces, and but it was just like you were sitting down in Long Beach and having a cup of coffee with some folks. So many things are the same, you know, the issues around crime, domestic violence, um, terrorism is at everybody's doorstep around the world. Um, and the politics of, of hate, the divisiveness is going on. It's not just America, it's every place else too. Wow. Well, yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I mean, you feel that right here, well, at least in our country, you feel that directly yeah. as far as like the connections, no matter where you come from, um, that we all have, are dealing with the same things all over. Um, so that's great. So as far as resources go, is there anything else that we can we want to bring up for anyone that's in that position right now? And <coughs> so one of the trends we're seeing um, that really concerns us is burnout. Is um, it is at epidemic levels across the country for fire, law enforcement, and the paramedic service. Paramedics are laddering to other fire departments that don't have a paramedic service as a way to get out of being a paramedic because they won't get released from their assignment and they're burning out. They're drinking on their days off when they do get a day off and they're, they're going through divorces big time. Uh, they're used and abused. Um, so that's, that's interesting. And they're leaving good paying jobs to go to lower paying jobs just to get out of that, that uh, ambulance. Uh, so burnout is the thing that's really rocking um, first responders across the country and also their families. Families are now coming to us and saying, and this is you know, all, all parts of the first responder community. I talked to my parents and they're gonna loan us money and you can quit, you can go back to school. Um, or my dad uh, talked to somebody and they have a job open. We don't want you to do this anymore. <laughs> if America doesn't value our sacrifice, meaning yours and the families, then they don't deserve you, get out. That's something that's scary because we're losing the talent across America. You know, these are the starters of any sports team. Um, talented, smart, committed, but their families are saying, get out. In fact, uh, there was a survey done early on in Iraq, Afghanistan. They said, what, you know, what, will, what are the different themes in which a military professional will re-up in the United States military? You know, they, after their initial contract, and they're coming to an end. <laughs> is one of the top three, three reasons was the, the family supports it. That's what's changed in our environment is the family is really worried and they're not so supportive anymore. So one of the things we're doing is creating 
spouse, significant other groups to, um, like in the military, family support, just build it into the first responder community. And boy, the, the spouse of significant others are eating it up. So. Well, you find that, I mean, especially in like these days in, in the law enforcement community, you let alone do you not tell people you're a police officer, but your spouse and your kids are, if they, depending on where you live, are not saying that you're a police, that your dad's a police officer, your mom's a police officer, because they may be looked at like they're, you know, pariahs or whatever, you know, it's like, so it's, I could definitely see that it's even a burden on that, you know, the whole family. Yeah. So yeah. Well, anybody with kids now is you tell your kid, you, you tell your kids if they ask what mom or dad does, uh, here's the cover story. Yeah. I mean, that was the thing when, when I started, but it feels like it's even more of a thing now. Like that yeah. was, it's even that, and then it was like, yeah, you don't really talk about it, but you didn't like avoid, avoid it. Now it's like you, people don't, you don't bring it up at all. Yeah. <clears throat> so what we're seeing it um, in schools, remember um, before COVID is, Hey, my, my mom is a police officer. And if you want, she can bring her, her squad car here, you know, and, and everyone does this, right? Bring the squad car here and she'll show you how the lights work and people can sit in the car and, you know, kind of Q&A, oh, very, very popular. And the fire department do the same thing. Law enforcement's not being asked to come and do those anymore. No, I heard that there was, there was someone who told me recently, and I forgot what city it was in. I cannot remember what city it was in, where they said like, hey, uh, do you want me to bring, we can bring the car down to the school? And they said, no, we don't want your car out of school. Yeah. Like the school specifically said, no, like they don't, yeah. not, not only do you are not asking, but they're telling people, they're telling the officers or the departments, no, like, no, we don't want them there to even be around. Yeah. That's insane to me. Yeah. And then you want us to somehow come and save, save you when things go wrong. Yeah. But you discount us and then call us names. Really? I mean, we'll still, we're still professionals. We do our job, but um there's there's there used to be a few thank yous now there's no thank yous um but that's based upon where you are in the country too. right yeah i don't know and california has a, a really tough job right now so yeah. especially and new york and new york yeah yeah definitely turning it around so i don't know what the pendulum swing is going to look like but hopefully it gets turned around sooner than later yeah well, I really appreciate you coming on this morning, and I know you're uh, still recovering from uh, having pneumonia after COVID, so I appreciate you doing that as well. And uh, your trainings will will continue through the summer, or when do they start back up? <coughs> well, I'm looking at my training board. <clears throat> we already have the first three weeks of September booked. Oh, wow. All right. And, already, and I have folks asking, you know, when can we book? They're just waiting to get final permission from their leadership. So we're... You know, but it's also a state of, this is the first time um, since we started the teaching company in which people are pre-booking stuff this far out. Wow. Yeah. Um, makes just sense. because of the state of the professions. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, if you're in an agency that doesn't have a peer support program or you're trying to revamp your program, um, look up Jim Hyde and it's uh, at uh, peersupportcentral.com. Right. And um, he's, it's a lifetime support system there. Once they, once they have like a program with you guys is lifetime support. Yeah. Lifetime consulting. We want to help them build a program. There's a lot of things we can do because of our skill set that the job gave us. This is something we want to see, you know, after we're gone, we want to see these programs continue on and save families, save careers. Right. Right. I think, it's, I think it's fantastic. I, when I hear that of uh, agencies having really strong peer support systems or even like wellness programs, it makes me, it makes me really happy because I know, like, I know it took me a while to get to this point of like what I'm, you know, focusing on as far as like the wellness of our first responders, but we don't do enough of it early on. Like it should be in, in every like academy class, they should be talking about it and really focusing on it. And I don't think we do, I don't think we do a good job of it, at least as far as what, I, what I've seen um, around, around the country. I think we need to do a better job. So yeah. if you are trying to build your program, definitely contact Jim. You can find him on LinkedIn. Um, is there anywhere else they can find you? Uh, that's pretty good. I'm yeah. on Facebook, but it's just uh, so I can see my kids. Okay. All right. Well, we'll do the, this is a professional stuff. So <laughs> peer support central.com or uh, first responder retirement.com. If you're uh, looking at retiring soon, or if you just retired and are kind of like questioning on what, what your, what your plan is and uh, definitely uh, find Jim. I really appreciate you coming on this morning. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to, 
find this podcast at letsgrabacup.com. It'll be on YouTube and on um, Apple and Spotify. And you can find me at sturgeonwellness.com as well. And then I'll hit this little outro music and we're good. Have, have a good, good day, Jim. Thanks for coming. All right. Thank you, Adam.